All right, so let's go ahead and get started with this session. Um, as I said, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Virgil Parker. I am a U.S. Fulbright student and HBCU graduate and also uh, a former William Randolph Hearst Fellow at the Aspen Institute. Uh, and I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today about increasing philanthropic impact for communities and institutions of color. Um, I want to give a very sincere thank you to the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, um, specifically the Mays Family Institute on Diverse Philanthropy, um, for giving us the platform to have this discussion today on Giving Tuesday. Um, this is a very critical day um, for philanthropy across, the, across our nation. And, you know, it's important to have a dialogue about how philanthropy serves our society and what can happen once racial equity and diversity is included um, in the philanthropic strategies. We have a lot of incredible speakers lined up for you today. Uh, Jane Wallace, Amir Pasek, Leslie Baskerville, Uno Asili, um, and Bernard Marcano. And these are people who bring unique perspectives about the, the, the potentials of the social sector, the nonprofit community, and what philanthropy really means to our society and how it can help us to expand. Um, just to kind of give more context, as I mentioned, today is Giving Tuesday. Um, so according to the nonprofit Times, just so you guys understand, uh, we raised $2.47 billion in the year 2020 uh, on Giving Tuesday. And that was a 20% increase, 25% increase than the previous year when we raised $1.97 billion. Now that's significant to understand, particularly when predictions today have us making a, a historic margins of $3 billion raised. What can happen when we realize diversity and racial equity in the terms of lens of philanthropy? with the various foundations and philanthropic partners who want to invest back into community and sponsor community growth, what will happen when those efforts are targeted and we measure our investments and we understand the ROI and what can be realized when we include diversity? That's what we're gonna talk about today with our various um, experts and practitioners and hopefully we can give a better lens and guides and understanding as to why diversity and philanthropy is so critical. So that being said, um, let's jump right into it. Our first part of the program um, is going to be a fireside chat um, with attorney Leslie Baskerville. Um, the attorney Baskerville very, brings a very unique perspective of uh, having advocated for so many academic minority serving institutions uh, where we have illustrious alumni who have contributed to um, American society um, from Kamala Harris to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to Oprah Winfrey to John Lewis. So many leaders have graduated from these types of institutions and she's gonna be able to speak to A, the significance of them and B, how they rely upon philanthropy. And most importantly, even if you are not a direct alumni from these institutions, why it is uh, behooven of you to invest in these institutions as we try to build and better our society. Um, to give a proper introduction to Attorney Baskerville, um, she serves as the president and CEO of the National Association for Equal Opportunity Higher Education um, and it's, it's a, um, only membership and advocacy association for the 106 public, private, and land grant two and four year graduate in professionally historically black colleges and universities in our society. She's a constitutional lawyer and the chair of the Alliance for Equity in higher education. And, and we are so grateful to have her with us today in her presence. Um, Attorney Basketball, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so very much, Mr. Parker. And I join you in thanking the Lilly Foundation, the Lilly Family uh, School of Philanthropy at Indiana U for hosting this. And I'm privileged to be here with my colleagues. I'm especially delighted to be here on Giving Tuesday. And I would encourage all of those who are watching us either during the, the program or shortly thereafter to go online and to give to an HBCU or a PBI, a, a tribal college, um, Hispanic serving institution, Asian Pacific Islander institution, but one of the institutions in America that are educating disproportionate percentages of the growing populations of the nation. Absolutely. Let's continue on that, that line of uh, dialogue you were just mentioning. Can you tell us about the significance of minority serving institutions and how they play such a vital, vital role in our society? Yes, I'd love to do that. But first, I'd just like to make a, a correction. Most people think that the community of colleges that includes HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities and tribal colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, Asian Pacific Islander institutions and predominantly black institutions 
come under an umbrella called minority serving institutions. And that's not quite accurate. Neither historically black colleges and universities nor tribal colleges and universities are minority serving institutions. Those institutions have no requirement that there's any percentage of a student body uh, based on a specific race or ethnicity. Those institutions are mission institutions and um, consistent with their mission, they are in the case of tribal colleges, they, they are educating disproportionate percentages of, of Native Americans and HBCUs are founded and legislative to educate the progeny of the American slave system and others, but there is no requirement for any number or percentage of minority servants. So there are minority serving institutions. Those are Hispanic serving institutions, um, Asian Pacific Islander institutions and predominantly black institutions. But together, this group of tremendous American colleges and universities um, representing the growing populations of the state, they represent um, more, nearly a thousand institutions, one third of the growing populations in the nation. And they're important because they're graduating disproportionate percentages of the growing populations in growth and high need arenas. Specifically, disproportionate percentages of students of color graduating in the sciences, technology, engineering, mathematics, in the health professions about which we've talked so much as we're grappling with the coronavirus pandemic. Um, in a wide range of, of, of other areas, homeland security, uh, agribusinesses. They are the students that are graduating from these unique institutions. Thank you. No, thank you for that, that insight. That's important. Can, can you speak a little further as to how the, these institutions rely upon philanthropy and you know what can they do operationally when they have proper philanthropic investment? Sure. So um, as with other American colleges and universities, they, many of them rely on philanthropy, philanthropy to support programmatic endeavors. Um, but if you look at disaggregated um, groupings of the institutions, for example, if you look at HBCUs, HBCUs um, that were founded out of the nation's history of slavery, uh, 200 years of slavery, and then 200 years of the vestiges of slavery. They're woefully underfunded, and they're underfunded relative to their historically white counterparts. And so their endowments are disproportionately smaller than the average endowment of historically white institutions. And so they often use philanthropy to stand in the gap. So for example, when um, Hurricane Katrina hit, uh, many colleges and universities have endowments and other buckets of funding that allowed them to continue to stand up their institutions. It, the HBCUs that were hit hardest in Louisiana and Mississippi uh, did not have those funds. And so we went to a foundation, the Ford Foundation funded programs that allowed us to continue to pay faculty on the campuses that were hit hardest. Um, it happens in, in any number of arenas. We also use those funds for uh, as a cohort, the HBCUs, TCUs, and MSIs use those funds for preparing the next cohort of presidents and chancellors and front office persons, chief operating officers, uh, chief economic officers, chief finance officers on HBCUs. So they're tremendously helpful in closing the gap between the dollars that they're able to amass with the support of, of NAFIO and many others um, from the federal government and state governments. I, did, I also wanted to add that it, it allows them to punch above their weight. I think that's so very important that when you look at these institutions, um, individually. So for example, the group I'm most familiar with, historically black colleges and universities, they're 4% of American colleges and universities, but they are graduating 42% of blacks with advanced degrees in the sciences, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And that happens because of a combination of the dollars we're able to cobble together from public dollars, and definitely the dollars that we're able to get from philanthropists. Thank you for that. That, that was very informative. I, I have two more questions for you, and 
then we can transition to the panel. Before I ask the next question, I do want to let the audience know that we will have a question and answer period with the audience. Um, please feel free to insert any questions that you have within the chat box, um, and we're going to try to address them at the end of the program. So thank you all um, again so much for attending and joining this dialogue. Uh, Leslie, thank you so much for, again for your remarks. Going back to um, your qu the questions about the academic serving as the academic institutions that you represent, um, for alumni who, for individuals who may not be alumni of these institutions, but want to invest, see the significance, what is your message to them? How can they go about approaching these academic institutions that they did not graduate from, but they see the significance in investing in these institutions? What advice do you have for those individuals? So if they're considering investing in and a historically black college or university, tribal college or university, or an MSI, uh, they can contact NAFIO's offices and talk about their interests. We have a list of all of the historically black colleges and universities, all the predominantly black institutions, Asian Pacific Islander institutions, Hispanic serving institutions, um, and tribal colleges and universities. But my colleagues have a list as well. And so if they're interested in one of the unique, the HBCUs or TCUs or the MSIs, they can go directly to them. But I would tell them that this is the best they will get the best return on their philanthropic dollar. These dollars are, are, again, they are helping America. They are the dollars that are doing most to close the education gap, the economic gap, the employment gap, the health gap, the wealth gap, the sustainability gap, the peace, the justice gaps. And if you want to help America to be her best self. If you want to help America realize her egalitarian ideal, if you want to help to bring peace and um, democracy and, and move us closer toward a pluralistic America, this is the best investment you can make. And Nafio would be pleased to help you make it if you reach out to Nafio at Nafio, or you may call us at 202 430 394704. Perfect. Leslie, thank you. You actually answered my last question, which was going to be what general comments did you have for philanthropists as to why racial equity is so significant? But you addressed that um, when you said that we can, you know, address the plurality of America. And I think that is significant. So thank you, Leslie. I, I really do appreciate it. And I appreciate your time here um, for this conversation. Thank you for having okay. me join you. Of course, of course. Folks, that was a very valuable perspective. Um, and I thank Leslie, and, and we're going to have some panelists as well who are going to give some equally as valuable perspective. Um, now to introduce the panel. Um, first up, we have Dean Amir Pasek. Uh, Dean Pasek is the Eugene R. Temple Dean of the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, the, the world's first school dedicated solely to the study and teaching of philanthropy. Prior to joining the school, he was the Vice President of Interna Inter International Operations at the Council for Advancement in Support of Education, otherwise known as CASE. Um, this is a global professional association serving educational institutions and their advancement professionals. Dean, thank you so much for joining us here today. Our next guest is Jane Wallace. Jane Wallace is the Vice President uh, uh, of the Aspen Institute and Executive Director of its Program on Philanthropy and Social Innovation, affectionately known as PSI. The program works to inform and maximize the impact of social, sec social actors from the charitable and private sectors so that they can help solve societal problems and steward shared resources together. Uh, she's also the founder of the Global Philanthropy Forum and in, in, in regional affiliates in Africa and Brazil. Jane, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Next, we have Brennan Marcano. Brennan is the Chief Executive Officer of the National GEM Consortium. Um, he has 20 years of experience in the nonprofit and private sectors. Um, prior to joining GEM, he was the Executive Director of the Council of Urban Profession Professionals. Um, a nonprofit whose vision is to seek parity at the highest levels of business and civic en engagement. Um, we are very eager to have Brennan talk about the work of GEM, um, how it serves minority students, um, and why investing in these types of institutions is so impactful. So we're going to very be eager to welcome his perspective today. And last and certainly not least, we have Dr. Una Usili. Dr. Usili is a global expert on philanthropy and social innovation. She has more than two decades of experience in leadership, economic policy, and research across both public and private sectors. Um, and she also serves as the Associate Dean for Research, 
and international programs at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Um, and also she leads the research and publication of the Global Philanthropy Environmental Index, the Global Philanthropy Tractor and Giving USA. So Una, we're really, really excited to have you with us today. Uh, so now our first question we're gonna go to is to Amir. Um, Dean, please in, in inform us um, with the dialogue we're having so far, you know, why is it important to have an understanding about uh, philanthropic impact for institutions and communities of color? Why is that topic so relevant today, but particularly on Giving Tuesday, please? Virgil, first of all, thank you for including me in this uh, terrific panel. And I think there are uh, many good reasons uh, why we need to talk about the philanthropic impact for communities and institutions of color, but uh, let me offer you two. Uh, one is rooted in the resurgent critique of mainstream institutions that have perpetuated inequities and exclusions, including some of our highest ranked universities who we typically hold up as paragons of uh, discovery. Many of the inequities were and are based on race or and what W.E.B. Du Bois and others have called the color line. Uh, communities and institutions of color offer a, a vital alternative to mainstream predominantly white institutions where um, discovery and education can flourish against the background of institutional traditions that were forged and nurtured by Black, Native, and Latinx scholars and leaders. Um, HBCUs, as we've heard uh, from uh, Leslie, and uh, as well as other minority serving institutions are places of excellence and impact that have until recently not been on the radar of mainstream philanthropy. Though we should remember that in an earlier Gilded Age, uh, Julius Rosenwald and John D. Rockefeller were significantly involved with what, are, what were then not yet called HBCU. Uh, but beyond higher education, um, communities and institutions of color warrant more attention because they have been uh, neglected, overlooked, and actively disadvantaged. Uh, paying, for them, uh, paying more attention to them is the right thing to do. And as we've heard from Leslie, again, they offer uh, wonderful opportunities for philanthropic investments um, uh, to, to fulfill some of the gaps uh, that she has uh, uh, spoken about uh, as well. This leads me to the second reason, and that is the way communities and institutions of color have been often served to uphold the principles that were violated by the mainstream. For example, I have been learning about the role of the black church, not only in incubating the civil rights movement, but consistently refusing to die, deny dignity uh, to those who have oppressed them. In today's environment, um, I think you see um, uh, some of this principle articulated in Heather McGee's work that shows us how predominantly white communities diminish their own resources and possibilities by discriminating against black and brown people. So philanthropy needs to discuss communities and institutions of color to correct inequities, but also to enlarge the scope of possibilities for all of us to learn how to better embrace all, all talent and all expressions of human dignity, and no matter where it comes from and how it is, how is, it, how it is expressed. Thank you for that, Dean. I think you, you definitely brought um, very valuable input talking about, particularly with the Black church and what role these types of entities have played in our society and as to why we need to have a all-encompassing look at um, institutions and communities of color. Thank you for that, Dean. Um, I'm going to direct the next question to Jane. Jane, have you followed dialogue within the industry, within the philanthropic industry, as to what is the thoughts around racial equity and is the industry speaking as to why it is significant? Um, please uh, let us know your thoughts on that. Happy to. I, I should note that uh, one of my uh, most fun several months at the Aspen Institute was working alongside Virgil, uh, who had huge impact in a short time. So uh, if, if, if the listeners care about impact, uh, they, they will love Virgil as much as, as we all do. Um, let me just before answering your question really Thanks. directly, let, let me just jump on something that Dr. Baskerville said that was very, very important and that Amir built on. And that is sort of who we are as a democracy uh, and the role of pluralism, uh, that, that ability to, for multiple cultures and traditions and, and races and ethnicities to live side by side, um, but in, and, and to practice their own uh, cultures um, and to do so within the context, within the framework of a, of a larger shared society and shared polity. So I was really pleased that, that she raised the, the, the concept of pluralism because it really is at the heart of of democracy and, and how it mm -hmm. how it must work in order to work. Um, Absolutely. A word about what, what I hear about, I mean, as you know, I work a lot with philanthropists with uh, both foundation leaders. So, so the CEOs that are hired to run foundations um, as well as the individual donors. Um, and, and there are kind of four ways in which they have, have 
changed uh, in a positive sense when it comes to communities of color. Um, but first, before I note those ways, let me just say sort of what they have in common is this sense that racial injustice is a system and it's a system that needs to be replaced by another system, a, a benign and positive system, and that's anti-racism. And that sort of view of it as a system is what allows them to map out their, their strategies. Um, there are four aspects. The one, one is that many of them started whole new programs focused on racial justice, right? Um, and, and many were already there and just expanded them. O already there were folks like Ford and others. Um, and, and the Hewlett, I'm sitting in San Francisco as we speak, Hewlett Foundation um, added a, a $150 million program that's over, over a 10 year period, um, plus an $18 million program uh, supporting organizations specifically working on systemic racism. Packard Foundation, mm -hmm added $100 million over a five-year period, very similar, plus support for Black-led movement building organizations. And then finally, they both and, and many others have invested in pooled funds. And what's interesting about pooled funds is they're very attractive to new donors as well as these established ones, because you can learn while you give, um, which is a, a, you know, a blessing that, that most philanthropists look for. Um, just two other points. And one is, is the sense that um, anti-racism must be insinuated into every program. That if you're focused on housing, if you're focused on climate change, if you're focused on nutrition, if you're focused on health outcomes, as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is, you need to be focused on race as well. Uh, and the ways in which uh, to, to expand access for communities of colors and improve outcomes. I mean, Robert Wood Johnson folks will tell you, you know, absolutely the best indicator of ill health, the best predictor of ill health is your zip code and your race, which is pretty horrifying, right? That, that, uh, that needs to change. And then finally, I, you know, the ways in which they've changed is that they, they're changing the way they set strat grant making strategies, the way they source um, grantees, the way they evaluate their work. And I'll say more about that later, but let me just say there is an emphasis on engaging those who are of the communities they seek to serve. More on that mm -hmm. later, but I don't want to take up too much time. No, thank you for that, Jane. And, and I will mention during my time with you at the Aspen Institute, I remember the very unfortunate situation occurred with George Floyd, and we saw how companies and foundations took to respond. And that yep. was when I first realized that philanthropy can be merged with racial equity and activism and meeting people where they are to, 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 to solve solutions. So I, I think that's appropriate to thank you for bringing up that context, of course. Um, the next question we're going to direct to Brennan. And, and again, Brennan, um, before I ask you the question, I, I really want to emphasize um, I'm grateful for you to be able to speak about the significance of your nonprofit <laughs> and how your service to the nonprofit um, is elevating um, our, our country as a whole. Um, so please tell us more about what the National GEM Consortium is and how it's valuable, particularly to the academic space um, here in America. Sure. Uh, first off, uh, I'm very excited for this panel. Thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity. Colleagues, um, I also want to say that I'm happy to be sharing with you. Um, I, I uh, had an opportunity to be fast, and so time I can share space stage time with you, I'm excited. So thank you for that. Um, look, uh, the National GEM Consortium is a 45-year-old nonprofit uh, whose vision is scientific impact. I always like to start off by talking about the vision. And that is our focus. It's on scientific impact. Uh, when I say we, uh, GEM is made up of a consortium of universities and corporations. And so it's about 120 plus of the top universities in the country. So all the Ivy League, top 50 engineering schools, HBCUs, they've all been members of GEM for decades now. And on the flip side, uh, about 60 plus corporations, I like to say the brand names that we all know and love. Uh, I won't get into specifically mentioning any corporation because I don't want to favor any specific entity, but uh, just suffice to say major about 60 major corporations that uh, are, are embedded in this idea of sharing that vision with the universities and GEM of scientific impact. Uh, not only do they share that vision, 
but they believe that one of the best ways of actualizing that vision is by creating high performing diverse groups. And that's really where Jim comes into the picture because having been around for close to five decades and having such a, a wide net of an infrastructure nationally, we're able to bring to the forefront the best and brightest talent in the country who also happen to be black and brown and a part of an underrepresented population um, to the forefront so that both the universities and corporations can partner together to financially support them to pursue their masters and PhDs in STEM fields. Uh, obviously for corporations, uh, uh, they're interested in that talent. And so they're trying to get to the front of the queue of the best and brightest talent in STEM. Uh, and we obviously make it a little bit easier for them and customize their experience so that they can hone in on the exact talent that they want. From the university perspective, the value proposition outside of a diverse student base, which lends to creativity in itself, uh, is longer term views on diverse faculty, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously in a collaborative network like that, having such a large uh, community benefits all of the stakeholders within the community. And so uh, fundamentally, uh, that is the vision of our nonprofit uh, and sort of uh, very loosely the mission of our nonprofit. Absolutely, and, and this question was two pronged. I should have prefaced that, but can, can you quickly follow up Brennan and tell us how does philanthropy allow your nonprofit to thrive and why is that important? Sure. So. Uh, I, there's a couple of dimensions to this. Uh, if we look at it in STEM, uh, there's a deficit of talent, period. And so even if we, before we put in sort of the dimension of diversity, uh, any organization that's bringing to the forefront the best and brightest talent that can effectuate change in STEM is useful. Uh, when you add the dimension of diversity to the equation, well, now you are starting to create, uh, you're starting to put all the ingredients together to stimulate creativity and innovation. And so we like to say, there are a couple of ingredients that stimulate scientific impact. Uh, one, best and brightest minds. And so if we're in the business of pushing folks to that master's and PhD levels, we're pushing those boundaries. Uh, individuals that are dedicated to science. Again, if you're pursuing a PhD, Lord knows you're dedicated because <laughs> it's a long haul. Um, a nurturing environment. Uh, no matter what you do, if there isn't a, a nurturing environment to, to, to nurture this energy, you're not going to succeed. And so we actually very carefully curate the organizations that are part of GEM. They have to have shown a commitment towards diversity in STEM uh, and diversity period in order for us to engage them. We're not going to be used as sort of the check mark for diversity. And of course, the last ingredient is actually diverse perspectives. And so we at GEM believe that we bring three of those four things to the table. We bring the diversity, we bring the best and brightest talent, and we bring the folks that are dedicated to STEM. And we work with folks to make sure that they're going into healthy environments. So when you pull all of that together, what you're effectively doing is creating the formula for stimulating creativity and for ultimately innovation and for ultimately scientific impact. Well, as we know, scientific impact affects the whole world, it's not just America. Now, obviously from an American perspective, look at it through the lens of American competitiveness, we're rigging the pack so that America can become more competitive on a, on a global landscape. But as we know with science and technology, it has far reaching uh, impact. And so when we dedicate our, our energies towards scientific impact, we're ultimately making America more competitive, but also changing the world. And so when folks invest into these individuals, um, you're really investing in changing the world. And, and that's a really great, and I also, you know, just sort of, I, I also anecdotally always mention uh, uh, something that I went through at a conference where uh, I met this young lady on the stage. She was a, a panelist as well. And she was talking about virtual reality, great panelist. Her name is Mary Spio. She's the founder and CEO of Seek VR and a GEM alum. Well, I didn't know she was a GEM alum until I introduced myself and said, hey, I loved your presentation and introduced myself as the uh, CEO of GEM. And she said, I know GEM, I'm a GEM alum. And so uh, hearing her impact, and you can imagine now in a remote environment, how important VR is. And a matter of fact, I, I just saw um, Mary on Ellen's show. So uh, I guess she's doing fairly well. At that same conference though, <laughs> There was a young lady by the name of Dr. Hedea Nicole Green, I'm sure some of you know her, uh, who also made a really great presentation uh, uh, on the panel. And I went up and introduced myself to Hedea. And Hedea said, 
Uh, and by the way, uh, the reason why I introduced myself is Hadea was using um, uh, nanotechnology and laser treatment to cure cancer. She had cured cancer in mice with stage four cancer and was on the way to make that transition to human trials, et cetera. And so I definitely wanted to meet the person that was going to cure cancer. And so I went up and uh, introduced myself, hoping that if I establish this relationship, I'll make it somewhere in the movie down the road. Um, and introduced myself. On the CEO of Jim, and she said, I know Jim. I applied. I didn't get selected. And so, mm. what is that Hidea found a way to still support her education and to go on and, and do amazing things? But how many Hideas uh, did we leave behind because we weren't mm -hmm. able? How many Hideas? Uh, and by the way, normally for us, when we don't get that support, we take those aspirations and put them on a shelf because we need to get a job. And so we lose that opportunity of being able to really make scientific impact. So when you talk about philanthropy and the importance of that, that's the importance. It's the importance of making those other Hideas who could cure cancer. It's the importance of making all those differences to science. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that, Brandon. That antidote was very valuable. Look forward to hearing more about what Jem does and around that topic of, of minorities in STEM. Thank you. Um, now to Una. Una, I'm very excited to have this conversation with you, particularly when it comes to philanthropy. Uh, some philanthropists want to present the question about what is the return on investment from their impact, right? What does their growth look like and how can they measure their investment, um, you know, statistically, uh, value added base, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I know that you do work around this context. So my first question to you is how can philanthropy sponsor economic growth? For generally for communities and institutions of color, and why is that so important to uh, focus on uh, community communities and institutions of color? Please. Yes, great question. I want to join everyone in thanking you, Virgil, for putting this panel together and for the leadership that you've provided in the sector overall, and really excited Thank to you. connect with this group of panelists. So in reflecting on the second part of your question, which is philanthropy and economic growth, uh, specifically in communities of color, I'm reminded of the quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I'm sure everyone on this uh, panel at least knows this quote. It says, philanthropy is commendable, but it must not cause the philanthropist to overlook the circumstances of economic injustice that make philanthropy necessary. And during the past 12 to 18 months, COVID not only has been a health crisis, it's also been an economic crisis. And many communities of color have been disproportionately impacted. One area that I have been paying close attention to is um, how COVID in particular has affected Black businesses. Uh, we all know that small businesses are the lifeblood of the economy, but beyond that, uh, when we look at communities of color and Black communities, small businesses play an outsized role in job provision, but also in stability for uh, communities. And in addition to that, providing positive role models internship opportunities, lots of different uh, components. What has been encouraging uh, during the past uh, 12 to 18 months, once again, is that we've seen an expansion in how philanthropists are thinking about supporting communities of color. Uh, Jane uh, mentioned quite a few important trends, but I want to lift up another area where we've seen some innovation, and that's specifically uh, targeted funds that support Black businesses and support uh, communities of color more broadly. Uh, Lowe's in particular provided uh, over $60 million to uh, LISC, a national organization that allowed LISC to then in turn grant um, uh, it was basically a grant, not a, a loan, to small businesses that were impacted by COVID. So what mm -hmm. I'm suggesting to kind of tie it up in a bow here is that we need to expand our thinking um, to, in the past, perhaps traditionally philanthropy has supported specific subsectors, maybe education, maybe health, but we also need to think about other ways, whether those are through grants, interest-free loans. Uh, one interesting trend is impact investing where funders are looking for ways of using non-traditional means 
uh, to actually invest in communities of color. So that's one part of the answer to your question. Now to come to the very first part, which is uh, measuring impact. That is a topic that I am very passionate about. Uh, for a long time, we thought of philanthropy as very much a heart issue. In other words, uh, if you think about the word itself, it means love of humanity. But what's exciting today is that we've added this notion of metrics, the idea that you can actually measure what's taking place and combined it with that love of mankind. So bringing the heart as well as the head. And what's exciting is when you look at the kinds of investments in communities of color, those have outsized returns. I think Dr. Baskerville mentioned investing in HBCUs and minority serving institutions, but in the same way, investing in opportunity youth, investing in uh, small businesses, many of those have generational impact. And so when we think about measuring impact, it's really looking at, of course, the return on that investment. In addition to uh, this work is not easy, I want to be clear, but we also have a lot more data today than we did in the past. And so in some cases, it is a question of bringing the data to bear on the areas that we are most concerned about, whether that's investing in our young people, opportunity youth, or as I mentioned in the business uh, sector where there are a new array of tools that actually can help uh, move the needle on some of these uh, longstanding questions and issues in our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Oh, no, that was extremely valuable. And Really appreciate your insights, particularly as an economist, and I hope to get the chance to ask you later to expand upon why a lot of philanthropic age uh, individuals should have an economist um, consulting them when it comes to their impact. So thank you for that. Um, if you're just now joining us, um, we are having an incredible conversation about increasing philanthropic impact um, for communities and institutions of color. I um, wanna give a very special thank you again to the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, um, the first school uh, solely dedicated to studies of philanthropy. Um, and this, of course, the Mays Family Institute on the Verse Philanthropy for allowing us to have this space. It's an incredible Giving Tuesday and we're having this discussion and we just got through the first wave of questions. Um, our speakers today are, are uh, Attorney Leslie Baskerville, Freddie Marcano, Jane Wallace, uh, Dean Amir Pasek, Una, and Una Asili. And we're, we're, gonna, we're having a great dialogue. Want to get to the next question with you, Dean. Help us to further understand and, and as we expand on this topic, um, why is it that people, how, how can I phrase this a little better? Um, how does the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy infuse racial equity into, this into its education? And why is it important for more academic curriculums to also infuse racial equity? Can you, can you tell us about that? Sure, I think it's, it's, it's a vital journey that we are going through a, in, in our conversation right now. And it's, it's re being reflected in our school, which is a community of discovery that has a, a fundamental curiosity about philanthropy and what philanthropy can achieve. Um, so the first thing we're trying to do is to be sensitive about the immediate concerns and consequences of, of our community. We want it to be a home um, and have everybody contribute to a culture of belonging. There are some who suggest that there is a there's an incompatibility between truth and justice, that these are incompatible goals for institutions of higher learning. And I think that's exactly the opposite, because you achieve truth when you allow human minds to soar together in community. And if that community is plagued by injustice, it'll, it'll be limited and incomplete. And the, you know, the more justice we have, I think, um, the more we will be able to discover. So instead of being actually opposites, they are actually kindred spirits. And so that's how I think we are approaching it as well. Uh, we have a course on philanthropy and social justice that we offer. We are looking at our curriculum to make sure that it actually reflects the diversity of voices and human experiences that have uh, are reflected in philanthropy. We were so pleased that one of our professor's books, Tyrone Freeman's Gospel of Giving, that recovers the rich tradition of African-American philanthropy through the life of Madame C.J. Walker is being uh, so widely discussed um, in many, many philanthropic circles. And of course, through the Mays Family Institute of Diverse Philanthropy and Una Osili's leadership, we're actually you know, counting the things that matter and trying to bring more light to the, the behaviors and practices of marginalized communities and thereby not only lifting them up, but also giving us a better sense of what philanthropy could mean for all of us and thus enlarging in, 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 in it as well. 
We also are supplementing by our curriculum through the institutes that we have that are often focusing on um, issues of, of diversity and, and racial equity as well. The Women's Philanthropy Institute, the uh, Lake Institute on Faith and Giving that sponsors a Muslim philanthropy initiative that helps us understand um, uh, Islamic communities that have often been marginalized as well. Um, and then through the Mays Institute, we're looking at giving in, in, in Latinx communities uh, and, and other marginalized communities um, as well. We have a required ethics course that puts issues of why at the, at the, at the core of, of philanthropy, asking us in today's environment, you know, how was it that we had in the past and that we continue to have these institutions that were systematically uh, excluding people? And we think that you know, the answers aren't easy, but if you don't ask beginning why questions, it's gonna be very difficult uh, to make some progress. So we, we welcome anybody who shares our curiosity and are very uh, eager to, to, to be in, in, in community uh, with the, the folks you have brought together today, Virgil. No, absolutely. And I thank you for that, Dean. Hopefully with the efforts that Lily is demonstrating and in other entities that teach about philanthropy, this can become a, a common culture. Um, and students and practitioners see the significance of maintaining racial equity throughout strategies um, and consulting their peers within the industry. So thank you for uh, Lily's leadership in that space. I, I, just, just let me, you know, not, not to sure. boast too much about us. I think this movement is inevitable because primarily it's students that are driving it. This is what the students demand. And if you're not responding to student demands, you'll soon be irrelevant. So thank you for allowing me to add that. No, of course. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Jane, the next question is going to you. I want to zoom in on again with your experience working with philanthropists for so many years. What do philanthropists generally look for when deciding how to invest their funds and in the best way um, so that we can understand for communities and institutions of color, what markers should exist as to what can be an appealing uh, attraction for philanthropists to continue to engage um, those portions of our society, please. Oh, did we lose Jane? Oh, you're on mute, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. I think you may be. That, that was so you could hear my, my puppy uh, barking with applause <laughs> over. So <laughs> the, 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 I, I just want to start by just thanking Amir for referencing Una's uh, most recent research. And I hope we, we, we get to hear about her research into giving by communities of color to communities of color. And, and if we don't have time for it, I, I hope Una will give us the website where we can find it because it's really great research, very, very important. Um, what, what they you know, tend to be looking for I, I, is, um, let me sort of stop, step back and say, you know, I think the key for many philanthropists, and here I'm going to reference both individual philanthropists and institutional philanthropists, CEOs of foundations, um, they are seeking guidance from proximate leaders. By that, I mean people who are of the communities they seek to serve. Um, who understand the assets that those communities bring. I mean, an asset like trust that, that can't just be created overnight, um, but also uh, recognize the solutions that those communities devise. Um, they, they know their context. And so many foundations, I think the most successful ones are saying, gee, I want to engage proximate leaders, A, in, in helping us set our overall strategy, have them at the table in the design phase of our giving. You know, B, help identify the issues that are key, right? That, it, that, are, that are going to, um, that, will, that are most urgent to address, but also will have the largest systemic impact. Um, and so they are not only bringing them in into their processes uh, for grant making, but also asking them to, how do I go about um, evaluating um, the performance of a given grantee? Let me just sort of step back for a moment to say, we have a bit of a model and that is that in the midst of COVID in 2020, um, the Council on Foundations pulled together over 800 foundations signed on to a pledge that basically lightened the load um, on the burden, the administrative burden on grantees um, that made sure that evaluation wasn't burdensome. It was actually useful <laughs> to the grantee and relevant to the work they're trying to do. But also, you know, I frankly trusted the grantee to spend the money wisely. And what those foundations and individuals have found was that wasn't just a, a good set of strategies in the midst of COVID, that turns out to be a good set of strategies. 
that more trusting philanthropy was producing the results that they, they sought uh, without burdening the grantee. That said, what we've learned from that pledge is now, you know, folks are trying to, to, to apply in particular in their, their grant making to communities of color. Finally, let me just say, their goal is to build capacity, right? If, if what they're doing is giving a $100,000 grant and walking away, um, they're missing the boat. The, the point is that what we wanna see is strong uh, institutions led by um, people of color, serving communities of color, reflecting communities of color. And for that, you've gotta be willing to be building capacity and be in it for minimum of three years. I mean, I, I advise philanthropists five years minimum. Uh, you, you gotta mean it, right? <laughs> or else you, you can, you can uh, perhaps even um, do more harm than good. Let me flip your question though for one minute. And that is not, not what a philanthropist look like. What should the grantees be looking for in the philanthropists that come to them? And I think part of it is that longer term commitment. Uh, another is genuine listening, um, some time spent on the ground um, and understanding how to fund movements as well as projects. Movements uh, are, are, are messy, they can be infuriating, but they give us social change. And so uh, if I were a grantee in this space, I would be looking for those characteristics. Oh, Una also, you, you used, and, and Virgil used the word invest, the verb invest. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, foundations are saying, I wanna use my whole balance sheet. I don't wanna just use my grant making uh, budget. I want to also take a look at the investment of my endowment and how that can be used to enhance uh, the capacity of communities of color. I will get as an investment advisor, for example, um, a firm uh, led by, by people of color, um, financial advisors of color. I will invest in corporations that are advancing, for example, a new wealth agenda for, um, for communities of color. So just to say, you're seeing more of that. Una and Amir and others are very much on, on top of that. And I think that space is important to be watching from here and, and beyond. Absolutely. Jane, I want to mention one thing that you brought up and Brennan as well and a couple of others when it talks about the relationship between uh, philanthropists and their grantees is to having that ongoing relationship. Brennan mentioned that a few moments ago is that what is your credibility in this space of investment, right? Instead of having, you know, that one-off relationship where a philanthropist gives and it's like checking a box, it's like, no, we, you know, we want you to understand our concerns, understand why this issue matters, understand what we do so we can have you be a consistent partner when it comes to to investing in this particular topic and space. And I think that's extremely valuable. Um, so thank you, you, Jane, Brennan, Leslie, and others who emphasize that of allowing philanthropists to be partners versus just one-off givers um, in these important topics. Um, oh, Jane, did you have another comment? I'm sorry. No, no, thank you. Of course. Um, Brennan, next question is to you, kind of going expanding on that uh, as far as relationships with philanthropists. Can you walk us through what does a successful encounter with the philanthropist look like from the perspective of your organization? And how does it usually commence? Do you approach the philanthropist? Do, do they approach you or is it a hybrid of both? Kind of walk us through the, the context of the interaction, a successful one. The question, what does a successful encounter look like is they invest. That's the easy part. Um, when you start thinking about uh, what are the different ways to actually engage with them, do we go out and seek them? Do they come to us? It's a mix of both, really. Uh, I think for the uh, them coming to us, which uh, for Jem and Jem has been around for close to you know fifty years, so they, when you're around that long, you, you get a little bit more opportunities for folks to come to you. Because I do think there are three things that we we focus on 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 that side of the spectrum, which is awareness. Uh, impact and relationships. The awareness part is really, uh, and so for us, you know, when I, I joined the Helma Gym five years ago, um, I realized that I had an organization that uh, was producing the best and brightest talent for four decades. So from just sort of a, a, a managerial uh, aspect, you're looking at a great product. Wow, I have a success story. So if you have a, such a great success story, but not every one of these individuals are being supported, to me, that represents an awareness problem. And so immediately what we started to do was to raise the awareness of the organization. So doing stuff like panels uh, is, is part of my uh, 
regular routine. Actually, one of the reasons why I was uh, running a little late on this one is because I was on another panel. Um, it's about raising the awareness of what your program is doing because a lot of times there are philanthropists that are already predisposed to your vision. They just haven't heard about you. And so the more you go out there and get your name and share more importantly your vision, I think one of the things Jane uh, shared, which is really important, is that long-term view. Uh, I, I am not the expert in this field, but I certainly see a difference between charity and philanthropy. I see one as a one-off type of activity and the other as a longer-term investment. And so if you're pursuing philanthropists, if you're interested in getting them engaged in that long-term view, you're selling your vision to them up front because that's what's gonna engage them in a meaningful long-term manner. And so generally when we engage with philanthropists, it's at that visionary level. Once they're hooked on where we're ultimately trying to go, then we can get into the weeds of how we get there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the second part to this is, is also the impact part because now that you know, you've raised the awareness and, and they're interested in you, you better have a good story to tell her on why they should invest their monies in you. And yes, they're very data driven. And so you want to talk about, you know, why they should put it with you. I'll give you a perfect example. NSF is one of our uh, major supporters. Uh, we have a multi-million dollar grant with them right now uh, over a couple of years. So as Jane said, it's, you know, multiple years that they support you for it. They're really uh, serious about this. And a lot of the reasons why they support us is because of um, the trust factor that we have in the community. When we put together our proposal as to why you should go through us, as opposed to you doing it yourself, it was because for four decades, we had built this community and built this trust within the community. And so it just made more sense to go through us if you wanted to get better results. And so we could show a track record of not just individual success stories, but the fact that through us delivering the message, it resonated better within the community. Uh, we do something called Grad Labs, which is getting ready for advanced degree lab workshops. And what that does is it sits with, uh, we, we sit with um, uh, graduating seniors at the undergrad level to educate them on the importance of pursuing an advanced degree. And we found that there are usually two hurdles. Uh, one is, um, first of all, they assume I'm getting, if I'm getting a PhD, it's because I want to teach. That's the only reason to get a PhD. And so we educate them that actually with a PhD, the world is yours. You're a subject matter expert. You can do anything you want to do. So we sort of recalibrate their understanding of why to pursue a PhD. The second part is for many of them, they financially struggle just to complete undergrad. So when we walk into the door and tell them the journey's just started, uh, they're not too excited about hearing that because they don't want to get into more financial distress. We explain to them that um, through GEM and many other organizations, you don't have to pay to go to grad school uh, to continue your education. It's free. In many instances, like with Jim, where you get an internship as well, you actually get paid to, to do these type of things. So once you remove those barriers, and then, of course, we do what everyone else does is we bring alums from our program because you can't be what you can't see. And so we show them that pathway that they can take and they trust us on that journey. And so uh, a lot of the times when you deal with philanthropists, they want to know uh, how, why invest in you? What is your impact? And as Jane mentioned, that trust part of it, as well as a track record, uh, goes a long way in, into establishing that with them. And then I think the last part, relationships, which uh, uh, many of you have mentioned as well, is that it's collaborative. NSF, uh, before they made their investment in us, sat on one of our judging committees. And so they firsthand saw the applicants that were applying for GEM fellowships and they were blown away. And that was something that I said, well, we definitely have to be a part of this because we can tangibly see what's going on. But we're in a cooperative agreement with NSF. They're technically partners with us. It's not a straightforward grant. And so we make decisions strategically collaboratively because they have skin in this game. And I think it's the best relationship to have because you're both going hand in hand towards that one common goal, towards that one shared vision. And, and just for the audience to know and correct me, for, first of all, thank you, Brendan. Um, when he mentions NSF, he's mentioned the National Science Foundation, in case anyone wasn't familiar with the, the acronym. Thank you for that. Um, to happy to hear that relationship and how valuable that relationship has been. Um, Una, happy to get to this next question with you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it two-prong. Um, 
um, one, to give you the opportunity to talk about your latest research piece that Amir and Jane has referenced. I think it's important to talk about that, how philanthropists of color are giving to communities of color. So I'd love to give some context about that. Um, for the audience members, if you're able to see, she has placed a link to her recent research piece in the chat and obviously it's a great resource to reference. Um, so I wanna give you the opportunity to talk about that and to also ask, you know, what indicators can philanthropists look like to begin measuring their, the impact of their investment after they invest. Hopefully you can merge the two uh, parts of the question, what your research, last research piece was and what are the indicators, best indicators for philanthropists. Uh, please, Una. Wonderful. I think um, the Everyday Donors of Color project, which was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, was launched earlier this year and could not have come at a more timely moment. I mentioned that COVID exposed a lot of uh, disparities, but what it also uncovered, I think most of us already knew this, but it shed light on longstanding traditions of philanthropy across diverse communities. And what we've seen during the pandemic is practices that have uh, been a part of the Black community, the Latinx community, Asian American community, mutual aid, communities lifting each other up, sending uh, family members to school, to pay for college, all of those practices were magnified and more people were able to see them uh, during the pandemic. Uh, another area that we've also seen that is um, continuing to gain uh, momentum is giving specifically to racial equity and social justice. So we know that about 20% of Americans are giving to racial and social justice. Almost 25% of high net worth donors are um, maybe it's about that number, also investing in racial and social justice. But what's interesting is that in those areas, uh, communities of color, donors of color, actually leading the way in supporting those organizations. Uh, another big uh, highlight from the research is when it comes to technology, we see that uh, donors of color are using technology at very high rates, giving via social media and crowdfunding. And finally, I think uh, even on the impact investing side, um, we've also seen that high net worth donors of color are actually uh, using impact in investing vehicles at higher rates. So that is a big um, body of work to share the findings. And I have uh, included the links to the entire report so that anyone who wants to learn more can go to those reports. Now, where do you get data to measure impact? Let's start with the question, what type of impact are you trying to measure? I think that's the most important thing. The good news here is there are lots of third party websites that can help you. So in particular, let's say one area that I work very closely in is international development. There's a website called Give Well, which allows you to look at everything from clean water, malaria, what cause do you want to move the needle on? There's research on all kinds of interventions and which organizations are sponsoring them. When it comes to opportunity youth, there's a lot of research in terms of where you can make an investment and what the return on your investment will be. So the, the great news for anyone who wants to measure impact is that there's so many more tools available. I would start with organizations like GiveWell because they have already done the research for you that show you the return on your charitable dollar. In addition to that, um, although I am a big data person, I also want to emphasize that sometimes the impact of an organization may not be fully uh, realized by the data. Sometimes the stories can be quite powerful. Uh, I really uh, loved hearing Brennan's um, stories about the students that Jin has personally impacted. I work in higher education, so I can tell you that very often I have students who write to me um, one, one moment that still uh, touches me is I had a student who finished his PhD at Stanford and he sent me an email and he said, I just wanted to let you know that I just completed my PhD and you're the very first black professor that I ever had in my life. And um, it showed me that a black uh, woman in this case could get a PhD and be successful. And so that's actually, I didn't even know that I had this impact on this person. So what I'm trying to say is our data um, however uh, rigorous it is, there's also this personal story component. Uh, data is also a, a number of stories added together, so they go together. And storytelling is powerful. The impact that a donor can have on one student and one student can also go on to do great things. So I have been um, 
really humbled over the years at the stories of impact that I personally have received. And so I want to encourage organizations, especially nonprofits, to capture the data so that they can actually measure the impact of their own work, but lean into the storytelling and uh, communicate to donors how they're making a difference in one student's life, in one community, and being able to showcase those stories alongside the data. Um, I think Dr. Baskerville did a very nice, uh, fantastic job of outlining all the data points and then merged with uh, Brennan's stories. We can see how um, having uh, an impact on students' lives can really change the trajectory of our nation and our world. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to thank you so much for that. That was a very um, well said and very thought out response, and I definitely appreciate it. Um, for those of you who may be joining us at the end of our program, um, we are having a conversation, a great conversation here on Giving Tuesday about increasing philanthropic impact for communities and institutions of color. I want to give a very special thank you to the Indiana University uh, Lilly Family School of Philanthropy for giving us a space to have this important dialogue, um, and especially to the Mays Family Institute on Diverse uh, Philanthropy. I want to give also a very special thank you to LaCoya Gardner, who's the director of programs for this institute, who's uh, giving us the opportunity here. Um, with us today, we've had Leslie Baskerville, uh, President and CEO of Mafio, Brendan Marcano, CEO of GEM, Dean Amir Pasek of, of the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, uh, Jane Wallace from the Aspen Institute, and of course, you just heard uh, Uno Asili um, from Lilly Family School of Philanthropy give us a great context um, about storytelling and how storytelling can drive philanthropy and it's important to philanthropists um, to continue in, continue their investment and being able to measure their investment. So great dialogue today. I want to share uh, another question from the audience. And Leslie, I thank you for staying with us for the duration of the entire program. I want to include you in the public Q&A uh, um, just to be uh, sensitive of your time and appreciate your time here. I'm going to ask the question, who can philanthropists approach to learn if their strategies reflect an adequate level of diversity? If a philanthropist happens to be listening to this conversation or has heard other dialogue within the industry about the need for racial equity in philanthropy, who can they approach to measure whether or not their strategy um, includes enough diversity? Um, Amir, I'm going to allow you the first to respond if you so choose. And of course, Leslie, I will welcome you um, into this response to choose. Dean, do you have a response to that? I think I think there are uh, wonderful consultancies that that can help you to, with, to do that as well. Some of them actually uh, run by Black and Brown people who can uh, help you evaluate uh, the diversity um, of um, what you are engaging in, and whether it be the impact of what you're trying to achieve or the inclusiveness of the process. Um, one one important um, um, a source of practice in terms of being much more um, attentive to uh, and inclusive of the communities that you're trying to um, impact is the Fund for Shared Insight. Uh, that has been a group of foundations and others who have been um, very conscious about the importance of being more open into the decision-making processes and including those who you're willing to um, engage. And they have a kind of a listening for good resource for, for folks as well. But that's been kind of a more mainstream um, um, uh, foundation-led endeavor, but there are um, uh, many small consultancies run by black and brown people who um, can, can help you also um, uh, adjust and reflect on what you're trying to achieve. Absolutely. I want to welcome Leslie and, and Una into this uh, question as well. Leslie, from the perspective of leading NAFIO, do you by any chance talk to uh, philanthropists and help them understand if they're giving enough investment into the type of institutions that you represent, um, of course, representing uh, minority students in education. Do you speak to philanthropists and how they can measure their impact and whether or not it's effective? You're on mute at the moment, Leslie. That's okay. <laughs> We're just adjusting to technology. Yes, as much thank as you. So um, yeah. we take every opportunity to go and meet before uh, national councils of philanthropists. When the groups are meeting, they will invite us. But um, importantly, I would say to your question and to philanthropists who are, are um, listening to this discussion, that there are umbrella organizations for every 
type of investment they want to make. So for example, in the um, area of the historically black colleges and universities and tribal colleges and minority serving, we talked about the Alliance for Equity in Higher Ed, which is a 22 year collaboration between the umbrella organizations of every HBCU, every PBI, every tribal college, every Hispanic serving institution, Asian Pacific Islander, that's one. If it's a, a matter of dealing with um, civil rights, social justice, you have the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law, you have the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, 300 and so organizations in that, but whether it's health or uh, engineering, whether it's early childhood education, there are umbrella organizations of, of those groupings. Uh, NAFIO has a list of 350 national Black organizations. So if you're interested in anything from early childhood to Blacks in prison, Black males uh, into te the teaching profession, we have those who um, we're familiar with, but those who've been around and had successful records of leveraging dollars that have been invested in them. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, Una, I'm going to direct this question to you last, but also um, connected to a question I was initially asked you, um, and we had a little bit more time here, was about why should philanthropists, if and why should philanthropists have an economist on their consultancy strategies? How would that be effective if philanthropists can understand the value of their impact? And of course, how can they measure that economically if their impact strategies, it has enough diversity included within um, their, their portfolio. Can you talk to that briefly, Una? Virgil, I love the uh, question. Every organization should have an economist. I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely. And that's because of the set of tools that economics brings to bear on these sorts of issues. So let's take early childhood education or investing in uh, criminal justice reform. What's the economic return on this? The good news here, once again, is that there's a ton of research, but often you need someone who's going to dig into the academic work and find those estimates for you of what the return on investing a dollar is on the kinds of outcomes that you seek to move the needle on. If that data doesn't exist, and this is where perhaps uh, many organizations often uh, lose, perhaps lose the momentum, then it's time to reach out uh, a local university, uh, consulting organizations to say, can you assist us so that we can track this data and track those outcomes? One area where we're seeing a lot of uh, work being done is around um, re-entry and returning citizens and uh, providing pathways for returning citizens to enter the education pipeline or the workforce pipeline. Those have tremendous returns. There's a whole positive externality to our communities, to our tax budget. Same thing with opportunity youth. So the uh, call to action here is that for many organizations, that data has already uh, been the work has already been done in other words someone else has done the number crunching for you you just have to go and access it but there are also areas that um, nonprofits and leaders are working in where the research hasn't been done and here there is um, there's a lot of um, work to be done but there are resources that can help you I think in addition to the kinds of impact data we've been talking about it's worth uh, considering for organizations to invest in uh, data capabilities more broadly so they can learn how their communities are uh, receiving the work that they're doing, develop mechanisms for feedback and community voice that can be measured as well. In addition, you can add in metrics around how inclusive are the approaches you have and how equity focused is your work. That's also an opportunity for gathering data, both qualitative and quantitative. So at the risk of uh, uh, sounding uh, to really push on, on our organizations, I think generally speaking, the data already exists. And so what we need to do is access that data. And if you need uh, support, uh, there are a lot of resources at the Lilly Family School and elsewhere where that can support you on that journey. But um, I'm excited that many organizations are already uh, gathering that data themselves or using existing databases to tell their story around impact. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for that, Uno. We have time for about just two more questions as we wind down these last five to six minutes. Again, thank you everyone for joining and thank you for the panelists for their very valuable insight. I'm gonna direct these last two questions of course to Jane and, and, and to Brennan. Um, Jane, I wanna ask you if what, 
there's a myth within the industry, so to speak, that you have to have a certain amount of immense wealth to be considered a philanthropist or even to consider philanthropy. Um, and, and I'm sure that's been a myth that needs to be debunked. What is a good amount of money um, for a person to have to begin looking at philanthropic opportunities? Is there a benchmark? Um, can wh What class, what standard do you need to be in in order to be considered a philanthropist? Can you speak to that briefly? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the great myth is that something that is labeled with a, a Latin word, philanthropy, must involve something unattainable, right? Since we're, we're not running around speaking Latin very much. Um, it, it, is, it is something for all of us. And Una, I thought, made a wonderful point earlier on when she noted that part of philanthropy, part of giving and part of, of volunteering uh, in, involves things that don't necessarily are, are not necessarily even mediated by a nonprofit. Um, it is helping out a friend. It is helping out a, a stranger uh, in need. It is some of the mutual aid societies that we saw uh, sort of spontaneously emerge during COVID um, when some nonprofits had to shut their doors. Um, so that you know, giving and volunteering is something that is available to all of us. Um, I did my first giving when I was eight years old, and trust me, I did not have money. <laughs> when I was eight, I, I'm a little better off on this Giving Tuesday than I would have been then. But this is a, it is a, it is a point of view. It is an action, and it is something that is very American. I mean, it's so built into our culture, uh, and so we we all we are all have the potential to be philanthropists, and we probably all are already. Certainly, certainly. Thank you. Brandon, I'm, I'm going to give you the last response to a question here, and, and I'm really eager to ask this to you from the perspective, again, of a nonprofit leader, the president and CEO of the National Gem Consortium, leading an institution that does so much for minorities in the space of academics and how you've described how science is important not only to America, but the, the global society. I'm very glad of what you do from the perspective of Gem. How would what would success on this issue look like within the next two to three years about moving the needle forward on racial equity in terms of investing and increasing philanthropic impact for communities and institutions of color? What would you like to see as measurable success within the industry from the perspective of a nonprofit leader? Please, Brennan. Well, um, you saved the hardest question for me. Thank you. Um, uh, I think at the end of the day, every nonprofit, you know, when you sort of uh, explicate your vision, your vision is almost the, the end state where you no longer need to exist. And so for us, certainly it's where equity has taken place, where we no longer have to talk about underrepresented populations in STEM. And quite frankly, we can extrapolate beyond STEM because this, you know, my lane is in STEM, but we're having a conversation is overall. This idea of underrepresentation should no longer exist. I mean, we want to talk about cultural norms where we don't have to specifically focus on trying to recalibrate some of these issues. Um, you know, I, I, I thought what was interesting in some of the, uh, you know, the two questions before we were talking about how can philanthropists sort of get embedded into the society. You know, one of the things that we saw at corporations is if a corporation doesn't exactly have uh, diversity within them, their philanthropic arm are probably not going to know what's going on within the community. And so I think you almost have to start, start taking steps back to really fix your own shop before you can kind of help other uh, communities. Um, we've certainly seen that as a process that we have, have shared with our, uh, our partnerships, et cetera, and, and certainly something that we think should be across the board. By the way, I also believe that universities play a, an integral role in this because universities are usually very heavily embedded within the communities. And so I think as philanthropists, if they're looking for uh, partners to really guide some of their uh, activity, uh, you don't need to look at much further than the universities that exist around your corner. Um, so I just wanted to just add to that, you know, the questioning before, but I think, look, again, we want to see real change. One of the things that's frustrating, obviously, uh, from a nonprofit perspective is Every single organization we talk to uh, know that the soundbite of diversity and equity is, and inclusion is important, so we hear it from them. But the change is just not happening at a quick enough pace. And it's not like these are uh, big points that are brand new. I oftentimes give folk, give folk a hard time because they talk about, and we're so engaged after George Floyd, and I talk about, so Emmett Till wasn't enough to get you guys excited. We had to see George Floyd before we... Uh, 
made this pivot and, you know, and obviously you can extrapolate even further back. And so we've been down this road before, the needles maybe spike and then they kind of go back down. And what we're really looking for is real change. When folks say, how do I have a diverse uh, company? I say hire diverse people. I don't say do conferences and brown bag lunches and stuff like that. It's not rocket science. Create a diverse environment if that's what you're looking for, hire diverse people. And so I think they're, you know, what we're looking for is real change, real numbers change, not more dialogue, not more conferences, but to be able to sit here and say the number move. When we chat with philanthropists, we talk about we want to move from this percentage to a percentage that reflects the population, period, not move by half a percent or anything like that. We want to make real change so that it's equitable across the board. And I think any half step beyond that is just at this point in time, not good enough. That's my last Well, thank you. Wrap everything up. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Brandon. I appreciate what you've said and what all the panelists and speakers said. This has been an, an incredible conversation. Um, just to wrap up, again, we're right at time, but I want to thank um, Indiana University Little Family School of Philanthropy for giving us this space here on Giving Tuesday to talk about this. Thank you to Dean Amir Pasek, Jane Wallace, Leslie Baskerville, Uno Osili, uh, uh, Brandon Marcano, everyone um, for being a part of this. Thank you, especially to LaCoya Gardner from the Mays Family Institute on Diverse the Philanthropy. Thank you to her, her colleague, Andrew Keeler, and those who've made this conversation po possible. Um, racial equity and philanthropy is significant. It is important. And I really hope that people continue um, to understand this issue and why we have to prioritize it. Um, and I want to give a personal thank you to the Aspen Institute for allowing me to be a Hearst Fellow and learn about this topic um, and why young people should move the needle forward on philanthropy. Um, in, in racial equity and philanthropy. And thank you to the Hearst Foundation. Really appreciate it.